Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk about this continued move to the upside coming out of the uh, long holiday weekend. First sort of day back after the uh, holiday, what happens? Major averages sort of slightly down, but some concerning signs from some leading stocks, which we'll highlight here in a short while. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Reben, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of the Stock Charts platform. Stock Charts was created to empower online investors to better understand the world around you and to better apply the lessons of technical analysis. We give a lot of a tools, education, and commentary to help you along, the, uh, along that way. What's interesting is we sort of begin the, uh, the third quarter in earnest here coming out of the 4th of July holiday. What happens next, right? And I would say when a market is in a sustained uptrend, which we're certainly in, uh, we have now confirmed the trend is higher. We're following that trend higher and bumping up our stops along the way, hopefully, if you're using good money management strategies. So then what's next? Well, at some point, we start to get some signs that that uptrend is most likely exhausted. We see signs of buyer exhaustion, meaning the people, the investors that are pushing prices higher, bidding them up further and further. All of a sudden, no one's left, right? Everyone's sort of done their buying, and now we have nowhere to go but down. We start to see signs of profit taking. We see signs of a market overextended or overbought and then coming out of that region. We're arguably seeing some of those signs here. We see some stocks that have been overbought uh, coming out of that overbought uh, range. We see things like bearish divergences on some semiconductor names, even Amazon, which we'll talk about here in a few moments. Let's get right to our market recap, see what else we can draw in terms of the lessons the market provide back to us in the form of price action and charts. We want to start with a poll, by the way. We always have a poll going on our social media platforms, of course, on our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe, turn the notifications on. You'll get all of them. You won't miss a thing. And we asked you recently, will July 2023 be a positive or negative month for the S&P 500? Let's keep it simple, straightforward. Are we thumbs up or thumbs down for the month of July? Two out of every three respondents said bullish, said positive. What's interesting is that's actually what the seasonality would tell you. July actually tends to be a pretty, a pretty decent month. But what's so interesting is June actually tends to be a pretty rough month. And so we've had this weird situation where June, which is usually a pretty painful month, Actually, it was finished okay uh, for a lot of uh, a lot of risk assets, of course. Will July be positive? I would probably hazard a guess to say negative, and the reason is because June sort of didn't have that deterioration, that seasonal weakness you probably would assume. And I'm seeing so many signs of an overextended market. At some point, you have to assume that we rotate back and sort of test uh, those uh, previous swing lows, test an ascending 50-day moving average. I'd probably vote negative. But let's let the charts tell us uh, what's happening and let's wait for the evidence of the charts themselves. Thanks for answering that poll, everyone that participated. Let's continue on looking at the major indexes on our market dashboard. The S&P about 0.2% lower. That's finishing the day around 44.47. The Nasdaq composite about the same, moving down about 0.2%. The NYSE composite down about half a percent. Mid caps and small caps deteriorating either even further with the S&P 600 small cap index just below 1200. That's down about one and a half percent. So, you know, one of those classic measures of risk on is that you see small cap stocks thriving. Now, what you have to remember is Friday before the holiday was the end of the second quarter. It's usually a bit of window dressing, uh, usually the day uh, after you sort of and Monday was sort of weird because holiday was on a Tuesday. This week, you probably get sort of a reset of uh, any sort of risky behavior that might have been uh, taking place during the second quarter, maybe reinitiated. Uh, and often, small caps will be a measure of risk on, right? We're, we're getting to more speculative out of benchmark names. Today, not really playing out. You're seeing more of a, of a down move in small caps. So, you know, again, that elusive uh, sort of rally in small caps that makes this all seem like a normal bullish phase just not happening yet. Uh, with today's sort of more of the same, further weakness in small caps on a relative basis. S&P 100 mega cap index uh, about flat for the day. And the VIX actually pushing higher a little bit. The VIX had gotten down into a 13 handle, 13 point something uh, into last week. Now bouncing a little bit, a uh, little bit to the upside, uh, moving up just above 14. Again, these are uh, still very low levels relative to the last 12 to 18 months. Pretty normal levels. If you look back at like 2016, 17-ish uh, we're sort of down in this range for an extended period of time. Maybe that's the sort of 
volatility uh, regime we should be uh, should be expecting. If you look at Monday's sort of half session, which is pretty about as about as textbook of a of a holiday Monday as you can expect. It's a half day and usually have lighter volume and kind of drift to the upside. Uh, that's sort of uh, sort of how things played out. Worth noting today, we never got to the close on Friday. We actually just chopped around uh, well below those, uh, below those levels. Looking at the interest rate environment, the fixed income markets, interest rates overall moving higher today uh, by a decent clip, actually. Ten-year yields around 395, five-year yields around 426. We were talking about the 4% level uh, last week, if I remember right. So it's continued to push higher. Long bond yield getting closer to, uh, to 4% as well. Short-term yields, of course, still elevated. So we have that inverted yield curve. But you know, one of the things I've observed, and we'll look at a chart of the 10-year here uh, in a little while later in the market recap, uh, we're seeing the situation where bond prices are selling off. Yields are actually coming up. And, and what happens in that environment, it's usually a sign of strength, but it usually implies a, a dangerous situation or a less ideal situation for growth stocks because lower rates make those future earnings seem that more awesome because you're starting at a lower rate now. Um, if you actually push the rate higher, the value of those future cash flows uh, is, uh, is a little, little, little lower. And so higher rates tend to be worse for growth than for value. We'll look at that chart in a minute. You can see that relationship uh, that I'm implying. TLT down uh, by about 1% today. The dollar index up by about a half a percent. That's another one to watch for. When we think about what signs to look for here going into July, I would say a, a, an improvement in some of those, um, uh, we'll call them safe havens, or some of those indications of risk-off rotation. Uh, the dollar would be one measure of that. Defensive sectors like utilities and real estate would be another example of that. It's a little bit of foreshadowing for what we saw in terms of the sector movements today, but I'll save that for another moment. Looking over at the commodity space, I was chatting uh, earlier today with uh, Tom Schneider over at Ninja Trader. We're talking about a number of different things, including uh, futures and commodities, and, uh, and uh, just had me focus a little bit more on this. What's interesting is about gold and silver sort of mixed today, but there's been no denying that the, uh, that the weakness in gold and silver recently has been very real. Instead of pulling back to a, a higher low and then rotating higher, sort of continuing to push through some of those uh, levels at which you might expect support, if this is a bullish phase, gold and silver giving much more of a negative rotation here in the last uh, four to six weeks. Silver prices today up about 1%, gold down by about a third of a percent. You can see sort of a very mixed bag in the commodity space uh, overall. And one of the few bright spots was uh, crude oil prices pushing uh, a bit to the upside. Finally, cryptocurrencies over the, the long weekend and now into today uh, coming off. Uh, Bitcoin currently around 30,440, uh, and that's uh, down about 1% from, uh, from yesterday. Again, this is sort of a weird holiday period where we're judging percent changes on Ether, well below 2,000, down around 1908, and that's down about 1.5% uh, from yesterday. So, you know, further deterioration there. What's interesting in the chart of Bitcoin, we'll get to that uh, as well if we have time. A bit of a divergence there, uh, I think, potentially on the chart of Bitcoin as it's attempting to hold the move, the break above 30,000, which I think was incredibly meaningful. Can it hold that level of support? For now, yes, but I think that's the question mark I would be, uh, I would be focused on. In terms of sector movements, kind of defense at the top here. Utilities up about 1.1%. Real estate was number three, up half a percent. Communication services had a decent day, up 0.8%. Uh, Everything else was flat to down on the day. Material stocks got hit the most, down 2.5%, followed by technology, and then industrials and energy tied for uh, number three from the bottom. So technology is an interesting one because obviously that's been uh, the strongest area of the market year to date. You've seen incredible strength from semiconductors, from the mega cap hardware, software names, Apple, Microsoft, uh, and others. Weakness in a sector like technology can have a very disruptive effect on our benchmarks because it's such a big weight. This is a really important time, I think, to, uh, to, to reflect on what sectors have the biggest weightings. These are not 11 equal weighted sectors going up and down. The wrong sectors at the top or the bottom can really change the underlying benchmarks very, very quickly, much more quickly than, uh, than you might expect. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500, sort of check in on where we're at. So again, not much change over the last uh, couple of days. So this is uh, Monday sort of half session. This is today's move. All of that is sort of within Friday's uh, day. So this is, I think it's an important way to think about it, right? Think of Friday as that gap higher, gap above 4,400. This is, of course, going into last weekend, you know, making a new 52-week high uh, for the year, a new closing high as well. Today and Monday session, although closing above the open, not regaining 
uh, the high from Friday's close or from from Friday's session. So that was sort of the move. Now we're sort of digesting, seeing if we can continue that move uh, that move higher. I think for now, again, taking a step back, I have these shaded areas just as general guideposts, or what I'd call the line in the sand. As long as we hold that, conditions aren't that bad. We we fail to hold that, that can be a cause for uh, for concern. So as long as we hold 4,300, I think the, uh, the the chart overall is still in a constructive pattern. I am very keenly aware, if you look on a closing basis, higher closes from mid-June to early July, lower momentum, and the RSI actually just barely touched 70, but now coming off a little bit today. Do we set up with this bearish momentum divergence on the S&P? We have not seen that in quite some time, actually, potentially playing out today. I would need to see a little bit more of a price pullback to validate that bearish divergence. This could be a huge warning signal just starting to form on the chart of the S&P 500. I would keep an eye on that for sure. The bullish percent index I want to I share with you. Uh, so the uh, bullish percent index is basically looking at point and figure charts on the S&P 500 and calculating what percent of those 500 stocks or those 500 point and figure charts are giving a bull signal as their most recent signal. Point and figure chart basically is thumbs up or thumbs down in terms of its most recent signal. It's a binary um, uh, indicator and so this is what percent of them are in the bullish phase versus the bearish phase. It's just below 70. And as of uh, the end of Monday session, it was uh, just below 70 at 69.4. We get above 70. I don't think that would happen today, uh, but we'll have to see when the uh, closing data all gets polished and imported into our databases. But getting above 70 would be pretty meaningful only because it often indicates the end of that move, the exhaustion signal. I was telling you in the intro, when we have a trend that's in place and you're looking for sort of that sign of the end of the move, right, that sign of buyer exhaustion, the bullish percent index getting above 70 is often a really good sign of that. You can see on the charts, the red shaded areas are basically just highlighting when the indicator has been above 70. So look at when we've broken above and particularly look at when we come out of that overbought region. Those are some of the most meaningful drawdowns, not just in the bearish year of 2022, but in a more bullish phase from October. October of last year to where we're at now, those those overbought conditions can often be a sign of a meaningful pullback. That's a danger signal to be watching for here uh, as well. So some signs of uh, of concern potentially, but again, the price will uh, the price will go until it doesn't. For now, I would say the trend is still positive by any stretch of the imagination, by any definition I would normally use to uh, to measure that. Let us look briefly at the Bitcoin, and then we'll look at a couple other things uh, as well. So I want to highlight with the chart of Bitcoin. We had a great discussion uh, last week with Adrian Zidunczyk. So if you missed that one, go back to that. That was a good discussion about Bitcoin and a number of other things as well. One of the things I would highlight again, just like the S&P showing that bearish divergence, seeing maybe that same sign in Bitcoin. If you look at the highs from late June to early July, the RSI overbought in the first attempt and not overbought there. It's a bearish momentum divergence potentially happening here. Now, as long as this holds 30,000, it's not bad. We break below 30,000, though. And then once again, this just sort of looks like a double top that's failing to hold support. That's what we talk about when it breaks above 30,000. That's great. As long as it holds it, let's see if it can hold it. By the way, it's not worth, uh, I mean, I think it's worth noting that we've stalled out in our attempts to get above 31,000, which was the April high. We still haven't really powered above that. We, we've tested it now for about three weeks, but haven't really powered above there yet. I think that might be an important chart to, uh, to watch as well. Now, I also mentioned interest rates, just to look very quickly here. There's that sort of uh, normal relationship. Now, again, I feel like normal is a tough word to throw around because we're in a in sort of an unprecedented rate hike environment for a lot of investors just haven't been around for this sort of sustained pressure from the Fed, uh, you know, pushing uh, trying to slow down the economy. So the market rallying in the face of the Fed's attempts to slow things down is a weird juxtaposition in my head. I will say honestly with you, you know, if you think about what they are trying to do is basically prevent, uh, you know, the economy from growing. They're trying to slow things down still. And that's what additional rate hikes are meant to do. If you think about what impact that usually has, look at how the 10 year yield has now broken above a trend line. Take the October high from last year. The March high from this year that connects pretty much with uh, just a below current levels, kind of the low for the day today. We've now broken above that. If you look at periods when rates have gone higher, that usually means value stocks are outperforming growth stocks. These tend to be a little more defensive areas of the market. These tend to be more you know, value oriented where you're betting on something being undervalued or overvalued uh, as opposed to growth where you're just betting on things growing exponentially. Makes sense that if the uh, the Fed is trying to slow down the economy, companies that are built on a growing economy are probably going to struggle a little bit. That's why they're called growth stocks. So rates continue to push higher. It's just not a great environment in general for growth. If you look, the relative performance, though, has not really shifted 
from growth back to value. Given the hike or the, the movement higher in the 10 year from about 3.4% in early May, I would have expected value stocks to be outperforming a little bit more. You're seeing strength in areas of the market like industrials. I'm wondering if that starts to make a ripple effect. Areas like energy that have been struggling start to do a little bit better. That might be an important chart to watch uh, as well. Let's highlight a couple stocks just to finish off our market recap, shall we? I mentioned with the S&P 500, a concerning development here, a potential bearish momentum divergence. It's not just the S&P. I'm showing you here uh, Lamb Research LRCX, which is a large cap semiconductor stock. Higher highs, May into June into July. Lower momentum. You find the same thing on the chart of Amazon right now. Higher highs in price. Lower peaks of momentum. So the, the, the signal, sort of the leading indicator, in my opinion, when you have an extended rally are these divergences can often tell you that even though the price is still going higher, there's weakness underneath the hood that is not quite reflected in stock prices just yet. I'm seeing those signs potentially here develop on LRCX, Amazon, and those are just two of a number of other ones uh, as well. Gambling stocks, LVS, when others have been some of the stronger areas of the market in the first half of uh, 2023, pull back a bit here in June. You can see the chart of LVS putting in a higher, uh, the high point was at the end of April, beginning of May. From there, we pulled back and then put in a concerning lower high, right around $60 a share uh, a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in sort of early June. This creates a potential head and shoulders top. The head here in May, the right shoulder, the left shoulder. Now, we cannot call this a confirmed head and shoulders yet. As I've mentioned many times, a setup like this, it's all about the trigger, right? So you have the, that is the worst trend line in history. Sorry, I can't even see it. I drew it myself. Here we go. So if you look at the uh, head, the right shoulder, the left shoulder, you make a neckline by connecting the interim lows with both of those. That's your trigger. That's your neckline. So as long as you hold that, it's not a valid head and shoulders top. You break the neckline. That's that final piece telling you that, yes, that was a confirmed head and shoulders top. We've now broken down with downside uh, potential much further uh, below that. This is maybe forming, and I think today down almost 6% is a significant move in that direction. You need to see it close below 54 to complete that pattern and validate that bearish signal. Important to me, though, that that's a, uh, a fairly constructive group. Gambling, which had been a pretty, uh, pretty strong group in the first five months of the year, now showing weakness and starting to show some uh, further deterioration going into the month of July. That's our market recap. We're going to continue on here with our final bar mailbag in a few moments. Before we get there, I just want to remind you, all of our questions come from people like you watching the show, trying to use the technical analysis toolkit, using the Stock Charts platform, and running into issues. We're here for your questions. We'd love to hear from you and love to, uh, to hear a question that we can share on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. And we're on YouTube, of course. Just put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. Don't forget, we also have a sister channel called Stock Charts, where we put a lot of really interesting content, more educational content focusing on the Stock Charts platform. So if you are a Stock Charts user, you want to make sure you subscribe to that as well. A lot of good content there already and much more good stuff to come. Let's continue on with the final bar mailbag. Thanks again, everyone, for sending in your great questions. We've got a lot of really good ones. I've been handpicking some of the better ones to share with you on the show. And here's question number one. Dave, does the daily RRG suggest heavy weather in the near future? And I'm taking a snippet. I, you're, you're, you had maybe the most poetic question I've ever received. The submarine deck officer of my youth is noting a shift among the equity asset classes. Is this a possible heavy weather in the near future? The equity fleet seems to be returning to port. That was your, the, a much uh, deeper version of the answer that you, that you said, in, or the question that you said. I appreciate that so much. So I'm using the RRG, which again, Julius DeKempner did such a fantastic job creating this and then popularizing it in the industry. I'm a huge fan. I've used it for many, many years, and I'm excited you have the ability to use it as well. Now, what you were asking about is looking at these equity market indexes, which is great. I'm switching it to daily, and I'm also switching the benchmark to one. So what's interesting is when you bring up an RRG to start, it usually defaults to the S&P 500, depending on what um, sort of bucket of stuff you're looking at. Uh, and if you look on our charts and tools page, we have a bunch of pre-canned templates of things you can look at. I'm looking at just some major indexes just to show you sort of, I think, what, what you were implying uh, by, your, uh, by your question here. Um, by changing the benchmark from SPX to dollar sign one, you're basically saying, I want to show the RRG using absolute 
price movements or absolute uh, price values. And what that means is it just gives you a little different view. Instead of showing how all of things are doing relative to um, the S&P 500, you're actually just showing how they're doing on an absolute basis. And when you do that on these major indexes, here's, let's see, uh, middle of June. Here's where we're at beginning of July. Do you see this rotation from everything sort of improving here in early mid-June? We're, we're sort of heading northeast, June 15th. This is a long and strong Everything's kind of working, except FANG stocks starting to slow down, but everything else kind of going to the upside. Look at what's happened in the last week, week and a half, as we go now into early uh, July with that holiday in there. You're seeing everything kind of rotate into the weakening quadrant. And I would say, yeah, what this is reflecting is the fact that the major benchmarks had that really big run. The S&P powered above 4,300, now pulling back a little bit. When this sort of thing happens on the RRG, for me, I've never really used the RRG as a trading system. I would never say, okay, you need to short all the benchmarks because this happened. For me, it tells me what charts to look at. It tells me where I should go to start getting answers to those questions that the RRG uh, brings to, to life. And again, that's what I love about it. It's throwing a bunch of stuff on there and just seeing what's different, what's changing. And rotations are so much easier to, uh, to visually understand. So I think the fact that that's happening tells you we're in a risky situation with things that have, have had a really good run. Most of these major benchmarks now pulling back a little bit in the month of June is at the beginning of something further. Keeping an eye on the RRG to see if they continue to rotate in the lagging quadrant certainly could be part of it. Looking at some things like bearish divergences, like I highlighted earlier, I think is also really important as well. And looking at that combination is what's so meaningful. That's why both of these things, looking at the RRG, looking at rotations, looking at breadth conditions, uh, momentum conditions, those are all part of my daily and weekly market routines for that reason. So I think you've picked up on a really important uh, development. I love the uh, the analogy or the metaphor of looking at the uh, the sonar array or whatever you would describe it in your uh, in the submarine. So thanks for that question. That's what I would I would say. I think you're absolutely right. It's showing you a bit of a uh, potential weakness. Look at some of the other evidence that we can bring to bear using price, breadth, and sentiment to really clarify if this is the beginning of something more significant. Again, I'm concerned the most by some of the bearish divergences that I shared earlier in the show. Next question. Is dollar sign NY FANG, that's the NYSE FANG plus index, more likely to make a double top or break out to substantial new highs? And I love I love the the honesty of this question, which is all right, it's it's at new highs. Are we going to continue higher or not? Um, and I, I would love to tell you I would know the answer to the question. I, I don't know, and none of us do, to be honest with you. But here's what I would do to try to make sense of it. I think what you're referring to, you didn't have a chart in there, but I'm guessing it was something like this. We look at a weekly chart of the FANG plus index. This is going back to inception in 2017. Um, you know, you have the low in October. We've literally round trip all the way on the FANG plus index from its all time high in October uh, into November of 21 to uh, a significant low in October of 22 to now nine months later back to retesting those all time highs. And so, you know, is this a big double top? Is this beginning of something further? That's a really tough question to answer, you know, as it's happening. And so what I have found is a couple different things. You know, there are different ways to treat a market like this. Uh, and, and I would say generally this, you can assume that that resistance is not going to hold and then it's just going to break higher, meaning any sort of pullback from that resistance level is something probably to be bought because you're expecting uh, you know, a move to new all-time highs. Or you assume that it's not going to work. You assume that this is uh, going down. You short the FANG stocks because we're hitting a key resistance level. You treat any pullback as the beginning of something more significant. And if it's wrong and if we break higher, you're stopped out of that short position or that cash position. You reinitiate along uh, to ride higher. So, you know, basically you can pick either one of those and, and, and treat it a certain way. What I am more concerned and what I tend to think about is a lot more about the conditions here. What you have to remember is the fact that a double top is potentially forming on the chart is not happening in a vacuum. We have a lot of other data we can sort of, uh, you know, bring to the picture to try to make sense of it. I guess it goes back to my previous question uh, about the RRG and sort of how to validate that. I would say, given the fact that the uh, FANG stocks are so overextended by most definition, I've heard people explain to me why they don't think uh, you know, some of these stocks are overvalued because of XYZ. I think 
Anytime you have to justify some crazy number because of, yeah, but, and there's something else, that's usually not a great, you're usually not on firm footing at that point. You're trying to come up, it's usually a sign of coming up with some reason to justify extreme valuations. And I saw that first when I was getting started in the industry in, uh, in June of 2000, and I had people explain to me why the stocks that had been leading in the late 90s were just going to continue to go higher because it's the new economy. That, of course, did not play out that way. We rotated lower, and that may be why I have sort of a natural bearish tilt to my analysis because of living through that period and seeing uh, uptrends sort of, uh, sort of stop. So I would be focusing on some of the things we talked about, right? When you think about a market top and you think about what happens when you retest resistance, I would say... Uh, you know, there are three pieces to it. There are leading indicators, things like divergences, things like being overbought, uh, things like breadth conditions becoming extremely positive that tell you or indicate we may be nearing the end of that move. There are structural changes, things like leadership rotation, things like interest rates, things like the dollar that might tell you there are shifts underneath that aren't reflected maybe in the index. It might tell you conditions are different. So whatever caused the, uh, the, the group of stocks to do well up until now, conditions are now different and maybe it'll be a little more difficult. Uh, and then the third piece are all more confirmational, right? The top has occurred and I can confirm it because we've already rotated lower. And I would think of your toolkit in those three different buckets. What, and, and now, as these things are still going higher, what can you use to anticipate that a market rally is near its exhaustion point? The two things I tend to go to are breadth conditions and momentum divergences. And as we've highlighted here, I see the bullish percent index on the S&P on the NASDAQ getting very, very close to those extreme levels. And NASDAQ actually already did break above and came down. It wasn't much of a pullback, but once again, hitting those overbought regions. The second thing would be bearish divergences. And when I see charts like Amazon, uh, you know, showing a bearish divergence, that is a very big red flag in my head, even though the price is still going higher. And even though investors on the surface can be very optimistic about another positive month, I see this as momentum deterioration, and I want to be uh, skeptical of further upside from here. So how do you trade? I, I think the challenge is making a, a position or, or taking a bet that you're happy with. What you have to remember is that investors have a lot of different levers to pull uh, from very uh, you know, cautious light things like going into the options market and taking a little bit of a position to cushion yourself from a little further downside. It's taking half off the table if you have a position. It's going short if you really want to be aggressive. That answer of how you trade it is really up to you. And that's why we don't, try not to get anywhere near that sort of recommendation. That's something you want to do is take what we talked about, take some of these warning signs, some of these confirmational signs, and then think about what that means for you and your money management process. That was a long-winded answer to no one knows is a short answer, but those are some of the things I would look at, the characteristics of the price as we get to that double top, which I think we're there. Next question. Can you think of a scan that could find setups similar to the Starbucks setup? And I uh, love that that is now a thing. I highlighted this on the show maybe a couple of weeks ago, which was this double bottoming pattern. The Starbucks, uh, the March low, the May and June lows, we're now testing support once again. Testing support at a 200-day moving average, kind of still there. And the question was, how do we find uh, charts that are kind of similar to this? Testing support and bouncing higher. The short answer is there's no real easy way to do that uh, because I would say something like price patterns are a vis very visual technique. Given the promise in AI, I would not be surprised at some point if you can say, show me double top, double bottom patterns, and it, it, it spits out a bunch of charts like this. I actually years ago uh, you know, have worked with some companies that did uh, you know, image recognition technology, uh, earlier versions of it, and had some success uh, for sure. I will tell you, though, it's still not perfect because it is a very visual form of analysis and looking for a particular thing that is actually very easy to interpret uh, visually, but very difficult to tell, teach a computer what that actually looks like. Having said that, if you Google, no, Lord, not Google, if you go to a little magnifying glass on the top of our, you Google stock charts, and you go into the top the little magnifying glass on our website, click on that and type sample scans, you're going to get to this big article on our support page, has a bunch of really good tips and tricks on how to use um, the uh, scans. And what I would look for is something like this, which is basically saying we're really close to a significant higher low. 
So you could actually use this sort of argument in your scan. This is basically saying this is a, a chart. Or I'm looking for charts that we are closed within 2% of the daily high or basically uh, closed uh, really, really close to um, uh, the, uh, the daily high within 2%. You could actually use that kind of methodology to say I want something within 1% of a 200-day moving average or within 2% of its last low from the last 20 days. You can use this exact uh, syntax and if you look in this article, you can see the other ways you do that um, to look for stocks that are charts that are very close to a particular thing within a certain percentage. I would use some combination of that. You can find it. I found the chart of Starbucks by looking at uh, a bunch of charts and scanning for stocks, making new swing highs and lows are very close to that and visually going through them. I like to have the scans get me to a list of charts that I can look through visually. For me, the visual component is still a very important part of my process. That's how I would approach that particular question. Next one. Dave, how can I learn more about, quote, smart money, unquote, behavior? I often have gotten this question over the years since starting uh, the final bar and, and even before that about smart money versus, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, what's called dumb money, which is basically retail investors. There is this uh, long held market maxim that you have the smart money, these big institutions that kind of know everything and have a lot of great insider access. And they have the ability to make decisions based on a wealth of information that you as an individual investor may not ever have access to. Then you have the in, in uninformed uh, under-equipped individual investors that really don't have access to good information and are just making bad decisions. To be honest with you, I have spent a lot of time with institutional investors. I will tell you they are not all smart money based on that definition. Some of that is not really well run and not particularly well managed with a lack of awareness of what's going on. And there are a lot of individuals that consistently outperform institutional money managers by just having better processes and better, uh, better uh, uh, game plans for different environments. The good thing about being an individual um, uh, investor, if that's how you describe yourself, you're way more nimble. I feel like working with big money managers, a lot of our time was spent trying to figure out how to do something because it was so hard. Right? How do we take this position and not have it be so difficult to do it? And it was actually really hard. We would love to have run a much smaller book that would have been much more nimble and easier to rotate and go to all cash and go to all aggressive funds if we would want to. And you, just, you can't do that as a big institution. So... I think those labels are probably pretty outdated, to be honest with you. Uh, but having said that, there, I think, is still value in looking at uh, what the smart money is doing, those big institutions. And not that they know more than you do, because I would argue the information playing field is way more level than it's ever been. And I think you have access to a ton of information that 30 years ago individual investors would have dreamed of and never uh, imagined. Uh, having said that, the fact that they have so many assets running, that's what makes the smart money so important, right? If they take a meaningful position in a stock, the stock price is going to go up because they create a ton of demand by just going in the market and adding stocks, which you would not do in your own individual account. There are a number of ways to do that. Looking at price versus volume is one of the classic ways to do that. Looking at indicators like accumulation distribution, check and money flow, I think are really good ways to do that because it looks at the relationship between price and volume. Big volume usually implies big investors, particularly unusually big volume. So focusing on that price to volume relationship and how it's changing, not just using day-to-day -day volume readings, but something a little more rigorous, I think could be a good way to measuring uh, smart money and where some of those assets are rotating. Flow of funds is another good thing. If you look in, uh, look for more information on that, I think that's a good way to measure that uh, as well. Thanks for that question, by the way. And we got to go to the last one. Dave, could the S&P 500 be in a huge ABC correction? You have a very detailed Elliott Wave uh, 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 description or, or argument in your question. And what you were basically implying is this. I'll bring up my chart of the S&P so you can see what you were kind of talking about here. Let's go to the daily chart. We'll bring in a little more data. Going back to the high, what you are basically saying is this is a big end of a big impulse move, and now we have a three-wave correction. Here's wave A, this is wave B, and then we have a big wave C that is off the monitor, off to the, uh, to the right here. Could this be a big ABC correction? I, I mean, sure, I think it could. It could. Um, what, I, what I would say, and I would say if you want to think about that sort of framework of this being a big bearish phase, and this is a counter trend move that we're in the middle of, which is a little out of, uh, it's a very much a contrarian mindset. I think the average uh, um, analyst is seeing this as an impulse move uh, since the October low. But if you're thinking more of the ABC move, I would go to Jeff Huge, who's published a lot of content uh, on our platform. He is an Elliott Wave-based analyst. It's a big part of his uh, platform. He has sort of been talking about this long-term bear case. 
I think it's incredibly illuminating. Think what you think about the conclusions that are drawn. I have always found talking with people and looking at work that is very different in terms of the approach, the methodology, the conclusions is so powerful. We love to get caught into this echo chamber and think I'm bullish. I want to hear from other bullish people so I feel better about being bullish. If you're really bulled up right now, you need to actively look for investors and uh, activists and strategists who are very bearish right now and see what is causing them. What evidence are they looking at? Who are they talking to? What are they reading? What are they thinking about that's causing them to be so bearish? That can really help disconnect you from sort of your uh, artificially biased uh, behavior if that's what's going on here. So if that's the case, by the way, we would have to have a wave C starting pretty soon. And what that would mean is uh, not just that we uh, find a bit of an exhaustion, not just a short-term pullback, but a level like 4,300 has to break pretty quick. And we have to go a lot further than that. And so I think the benefit of, or the, I guess, the reality of something like a big ABC correction, that wave C often gives us plenty of warning. We can track the rotation from this wave B if that's what we're into a wave C. And there are levels that I would look at that would confirm to me, yep, that is now the beginning of a big deterioration. A level like 4,300 has to be hit first. So I'm very happy being patient and waiting for that level to break before I start thinking about a doomsday scenario and positioning myself for that sort of potential downside. Hope you, uh, hope you like that answer. And thank you guys so much, all of you, for sending in those five really thoughtful questions. we got to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, we're in this uh, bullish phase, as we know. We've talked on the show here in the course of 2023, all the signs of strength. And, and as we've often talked about, strength tends to beget future strength, right? The, the most bullish thing the market can do is go up. And that's what we've seen month over month in the year of 2023. Now, at some point, that uptrend changes. And we've seen some potential warning signs through the course of the spring. Has not played out yet. We're starting July, continue to push to the upside. Charts like Meta up another 3% coming out of the 4th of July holiday. This is where I think it's really important when a stock has broken uh, sort of all the upside resistance levels you might expect. It's hit the 38.2% level and broken through. It's hit the 61.8% level and broken through. There's nothing left, according to Fibonacci retracements, than all-time highs just above 380. So what is left is a good money management strategy. Things like an ascending 50-day moving average, making sure we hold that on any pullbacks. The chandelier system, the chandelier exits, which making sure we hold that on any sort of pullback. Those are the sort of simple trend following devices. And in some cases, like the chandelier exits, it's not horribly simple, actually. It's, 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 it's simple in its calculation, but very powerful in how dynamic it can be because it's based on average true range. Those levels holding on a pullback is an important part of this continued bullish thesis. That's why a chart like this and just sitting back, watching the price go higher and having signals for when that's different, I think is a very important way to navigate the second half of 2023 because a bull phase, one thing I found, it always comes to an end at some point, so be ready for it. Chart number two, home builders. I want to highlight the ITB because it was overbought going into the long holiday weekend. Here coming back on a Wednesday, down just over 1%. Not a huge down day, but coming out of that overbought region. And that's another thing I would look for, right? In this sort of environment, when you see uh, groups like semiconductors, like home builders that have had these incredible runs, airlines now having these nice moves to the upside, at some point, we hit an exhaustion point. And at things like divergences, also just a simple measure of we were overbought and now we're not anymore. And if you look back at major tops on the ITB or most other charts, you'll find that that overbought condition usually tells us we're, we're, we're moving high in a, we're moving, moving to the upside in a very strong way. But at some point, we start to alleviate that, uh, that strong move. Coming out of the overbought region today is a, is a red flag of sorts that I'll be watching on home builders. Again, still one of the better groups. Think about what this chart could do and still be bullish. I think it can get down to an ascending 50-day moving average. That's around $78. That's $6 below current levels and still be a pretty bullish chart. And I think that's an important way to think about multiple time frames. Finally, and this is just a, a comical way to, uh, to think about it, the top-ranked stock in our large cap scooter rankings is Super Microcomputer SMCI, and nothing against the good folks at Super uh, Microcomputer, but it just sounds like the most frothy sort of late 90s name for a company that I could, only if it was supermicrocomputer.com could that be any more of a toppy sort of company to be at the top of the list. I'm also noticing charts like Applovin having these nice moves in 2023. I'm tongue in cheek pointing out that these sort of <laughs> these sort of names uh, for companies are sort of uh, sort of frothy toppy, but what I can't deny is that the price continues to go higher. 
what the, the lesson of this chart is to remember, it doesn't really matter what the name is, what the ticker represents. In my opinion, what matters is the price. And these stocks keep making higher highs and higher lows. Get concerned, get very confident in a bearish call when those higher highs and higher lows stop happening for now. It's an uptrend until proven otherwise. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. We have a great guest tomorrow, Mary Ann Bartels, joining us for the first time. So look forward to sharing her thoughts with all of you. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe. See you tomorrow.